I'm to have to say to absolutely um two of my heroes i remember our conversation um before i was it was absolutely life-changing and i was really really keen to to get you on to our um etihad world class wednesday um series um for those of you who are listening to us um as a recording um you may know you may notice a it's very very dark behind me because it's um it's five in the morning um currently while we're making the recording uh, i think bruce is 8 p.m in the evening and i think lisa um it's 6 p.m in the evening so they're on each of the the east and west of the united states um and obviously we're in uh, in abu dhabi listening to these guys but but first of all uh, welcome to the podcast wednesday um it's an honor and privilege to be talking to you guys let's let's start with a couple of introductions if i go with ladies first so lisa perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started sure first of all thank you so much andrew it's been a joy to meet you in the past couple of weeks here actually i think it's been more than a month now and so i'm very excited to be present and alongside my my partner and dear dear friend bruce crier so we are thrilled to be here my name is Lisa May. I am the founder of Fulla. Fulla means abundance and fulfillment. And this journey for me uh, started back in 2008. I was working in medical device for almost 20 years of my life. And I had a very clear revelation, a very clear download come through during that year, a very big year professionally for me as I was leading a a franchise for the obesity business in the United States for Johnson & Johnson. Very, very rewarding from the patient perspective and the team perspective, amazing team, amazing products, serving a client base, a patient base in need. And so there was so much good, but during this time, I found myself in a really challenging place. I felt like I was losing myself and I was falling prey to the stress of the environment, the travel, the pressure for the numbers, all of the above. And I really felt like I was disconnecting with mind, body, spirit in many ways. And so that led me on a 10 plus year journey to where we are now. And I had to experience those beautiful pains, those beautiful revelations, so that we could be here. And so that's a, a beautiful thing. Johnson Johnson, I love the company and I still am so grateful for all the experiences, but I had to exit so I could continue to explore my inner world to understand what had happened to me because everything in the outer world was going quite well. And so it was um, perplexing to me to say the least. And that led me to where we are today and full of represents a host of tools, models, methodologies, all founded in science to help us unlock as humans. So that's my quick story. That is um, very, I'm, I'm gonna circle back to that, Lisa, if it's okay, because it's absolutely fantastic. Let's, let's go over to Bruce quickly. So um, Bruce, perhaps you could just introduce you uh, yourself to our, uh, to our listeners as well. That'd be fantastic. Sure, uh, Andrew, it's really a pleasure to be here. Great meeting you, uh, as Lisa mentioned uh, a month ago or so. Um, I have a, a great fondness for HR people from the UK. I've known a lot of them over the years. From we've from, we, we, we from, misled you. We've misled you. <laughs> I know. I'm aware of that. Actually, that's why I like them anyway. <laughs> but uh, but a little bit of, on my background. Um, I'm the founder of uh, what's called Renaissance Human, and my concept behind Renaissance Human is that all human beings are fundamentally creative. And we have the, whether we're artistic or not, it's a different story, but we're all creative. And we have the ability to create our life in ways that we can't imagine, if, as long as we doubt that. And so I'm committed to the idea that we are all as humans capable of continuing to give birth to new parts of ourselves, new talents, new skills, new capacities. It doesn't happen only when we're young. We, we believe because of society that it kind of wanes <laughs> as we get older and then it stops. And God forbid you should have a, a, a thought about your career in your mid forties or fifties and people will accuse you of midlife crisis. And when in fact, there's probably just something trying to be born in you that's new and maybe different than what you had been before. So why I've been interested in something like this is there's several reasons. I've, I'm kind of a lifelong uh, personal development and health junkie <laughs> in a good way. 
and been in that field for a long time. My first career was as an actor, singer, dancer in New York. Uh, it was a fantastic five years of singing and dancing and acting and in wonderful shows and a few un unmemorable TV commercials and small films. Uh, but I had a, I, I found a great love of people actually in learning how to perform and um, share my heart through performance with people. But at a certain point, I thought, I want to work directly with people, not just playing the role of somebody who is able to entertain people. How can I help them uh, when the, the wonderful buzz of the Saturday night show in New York City has waned? What do they do mon Monday morning at 9 a.m.? And I started on a journey uh, in my in my 20s to explore that, first of all, by learning to grow myself. And the journey took me into many uh, fields of publishing and uh, nutrition and marketing. And I found a love for business. And uh, I was very fortunate that in 1990, I was asked by uh, the founder of an organization called HeartMath to become one of the founding directors and part of the leadership when the organization started. And I stayed with that company for more than 20 years. I was CEO for about 11 years. And while many of your listeners, the, the folks of Etihad, may not have heard of Heart, HeartMath before, it's developed quite a sterling reputation for a science-based you heard the same term as Lisa mentioned, a science-based approach to human performance, stress management, uh, emotional well-being. And so I became very much in part of that, leading the efforts, especially leading the efforts in the corporate world. Um, one of my clients, is, as you heard, was Cathay Pacific Airways. And we had the opportunity to bring these very scientifically-based tools into the flight crews of Cathay uh, worldwide. And so uh, I had a, it was a wonderful journey. And right around a similar time as Lisa's uh, shift, uh, I had mine and I got sick. And it was a series of things that had me. Um, I didn't ever feel I was on death's door, but the term life threatening was used a few too, ten, few too many times for my comfort, <laughs> for my comfort yeah. level. And, and here I am, 13 years cancer free, 12 years uh, staff infection free. Uh, coming up on 12 years with two new titanium hips. Thank you very much. And uh, wow. so I, I went through all that and there were some family issues. My mother passed away and my marriage was ending. Other than that, you know, no big deal. Um, but part of what that showed me was that while I similarly was working for an incredible organization, HeartMath, that I felt completely identified with and loved the opportunity to travel around the world for continents, teaching and training and working with leaders and organizations of all kinds and shapes and sizes. Still, uh, that, that series of illnesses and personal issues made me reflect and think there's something next for me. And that was one of the hardest decisions of my life to step down as CEO of HeartMath, actually. But it's, it's something that still is so much part of me that I still, I still teach it at Stanford. I've been teaching, as I think I mentioned to you when, our, when we last met, I've been on the faculty at Stanford for 25 years now, teaching these wow. concepts of, of human performance and health and emotional well-being. And I think part of what has brought uh, Lisa and me together, in addition to the fact that we just were kind of glommed onto one another when we met at an event several years ago, uh, was this love of science and this desire, not just because organizations need it, they want to know the validation, they want to... If so many organizations are run by data type people that are engineers or they're scientific or whatever, not only do they need it, but I, from my own personal um, confidence, want to know what's the science. What I want to, if I'm going to recommend to somebody to do certain techniques or practices in the name of less stress, better communication, uh, a stronger culture, I want to know there's evidence behind that. And so that's part of what what draws me to this work of heart math and to the work that Lisa and I do together, and uh, and why I'm excited to be here talking to you and your and your audience. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I, um, I I know my my audience knows this. I'm not sure whether we've um, we've spoken about this before, but I in my sort of late I had a not in your league, Bruce. Um, in my in my late teens, um, I was uh, I was known for kind of juggling chainsaws um, in Covent Garden and riding unicycles. So I was that was my the early part of my career. I'm a phenomenal. I'm, I'm gonna say phenomenal. I wasn't that. That's not true. I'm a good juggler. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good juggler. Um, okay. Okay. But, juggling chainsaws. That you got me right there. That <laughs> in Covent Garden. <laughs> in Covent Garden. Yeah. So I'm quite. I'm a. I'm a good juggler, but it's. Um, and, I, and I can. I can work a crowd, um, which is very useful. Um, it's. It's good. It's a good thing to have when you work in HR. If you can work a crowd, it's definitely a good thing to work. If you can work, I don't know, but I find it. 
um, strangely, not dissimilar to when I was listening to you, I was there was a lot of there was kind of a lot of synergy there because it's quite it is that it's that kind of youth euphoria and you've got those that those individuals very almost like instant gratification for when you're kind of working. Um, but yeah, but it, it's uh, it, there's that kind of like I was I was having quite a, quite a difficult crash. I I I spent quite a lot of my time. I I made you know I do um. My, my career sort of moved in different directions and I, I, I then obviously developed, I'm a fairly good um, plate spinner, I mean metaphorically speaking and literally. Um, so I'm quite good, I, I, I also do quite good plate spinning which is always fascinating, people get very frustrated with me with plate spinning because I think even plate spinning even more than juggling because when you, if you saw me spinning a plate you just go, that just doesn't make sense. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Um, right. And then, and then, and then, and then they they just say, well, I must be able to do that. Then I, I've obviously missed something in my life. And then they try to do it, and it, obviously it's a catastrophe. Um, doesn't doesn't tend to work, which is I think quite interesting. But then I'd also I then when my when my daughter was about five or six, I think we went to a, a children's birthday party. But then my my career had moved on a little bit. Um, to be fair, Bruce. And um, I was working with Hilton International at the time, but my 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 daughter was about five, and she wanted a a balloon modeler for her sort of fifth birthday or sixth birthday. I think it was fifth birthday. But um, well, it was it was just it wasn't it wasn't a bad experience. It just wasn't very good. And I just remember watching her thinking, "You're not very good at this, really. Um, I'm paying you quite a lot of money to do this, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really that impressed with your ability." And I, I thought there must be a lot more to it. And I, so I then sort of like started developing um, another skill, which is balloon modeling, which is quite, which also served me very well. So I've then balloon, I've done balloon modeling for people like, um, you, which you may not be familiar with people um, like Frank Lampard and John Terry and Jesse Mourinho. And they're, they're sort of fairly major, um, you know, sort of what we, what you would call soccer stars in the, in the UK. Mm, Mourinho yeah. is a very famous um, yeah, soccer yeah. manager. Yeah. So uh, Didier Drogba. So we, we did some like birthday parties um, and it was, yeah, it was really, really interesting. So quite, yeah, hey, that's quite fascinating. I'm loving the, uh, I've never been able to dance or sing though. Well, I think I can dance, but I definitely can't sing. Uh, <laughs> would be cool. Let's, let's go back a, to you. Uh, <laughs> get enough drinks in you. Anybody thinks they can dance. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that is a real, um, that's the rule. Oh, we have this thing. Um, you have strictly come, um, strictly come dancing as well. We don't really get much of it over here because it's, um, we don't have, sort of terrestrial TV, but um, always quite fascinated by Strictly Come Dancing. I think actually if someone taught me, I probably would be okay. Definitely got the energy and the passion. Um, let's let's go back to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm boring the conversation here, but let's go back to um, to Lisa just quickly. So I'm just really curious about that inner voice. So you had that inner voice and you were, you were sort of like, you, you're incredibly successful sort of corporate executive. And then you're kind of like, there's a, you're, you're talking about that disconnect. Uh, perhaps you could tell us more about that disconnect and how that felt and what, what the kind of the outcomes of that were. Yes, happy to, happy to. And I think that's the mission now is to share that because it was the most outwardly stimulating environment I'd ever experienced leading a, a business of that size with the caliber of talent that I had the opportunity to work around and support and the real need, it, as I mentioned, the, the real need, the crisis of obesity in our country and the world is a global pandemic in and of itself. And so that was very stimulating and, and nourishing for me on many levels, but I have never in my life to this point in time felt more lonely. And it was isolating, it was heart-wrenching, it was, um, beyond my capacity to process, to be very candid, Andrew, mentally or emotionally. Spiritually, I think I was actually feeling uh, feeling the change before my mind and body caught up. And the messaging that came through was so clear that there was a different way to live, a different way to lead, and a different way to serve. And you hand that to me as an action-oriented leader at that time, and 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 I'm like, okay, what do I do with that right now? And that was um, very scary, very, very frightening on many levels, and and the most beautiful journey ever. So, yes, I felt um, I felt deep shame as well. I felt very ashamed because I was succession plan for the next roles. I had these beautiful opportunities. And so I felt um, 
I don't know, in, in many ways, like an imposter, I guess, because I was doing pretty well to the onlooker, but I was a mess on the inside. So how is that congruent? And so I didn't feel very, very, very well inside or outside. It's the, I think that's, that's something we come across a lot. I, I, I speak to a lot of incredible people, um, you amongst them. And the, the, this has been one, one of the things that I, I spoke to some of the, um, I spoke to a lot of guys at Harvard University and they, they one of the, one of their sort of like they senior lecturers said to me, Stotts, you know, you're, it's, it's, I think the biggest benefactor probably of these whole, this whole kind of journey you've been on with world class has been, you know, you listening and interviewing these amazing people, right? And it's just fascinating. But that's, that is a, that, that resonates continuously. It's interesting that, 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 that kind of the word use, the word shame, you know, but, you know, perhaps we could, why, why, why specifically, why did you choose shame as, as a word? That was interesting. Yeah, that's a good, it's a, it's a good question. And I think that, I was so grateful for the opportunities. You know, the backstory is that J and J took a chance on me. I had a non-traditional background. I did not hit the CV marks of someone that they would traditionally hire into med device. So Don Cole, my hiring manager way back when, 1999, he took a chance on me. And so the reason shame comes in is because I don't ever wanna let someone down that I respect and that I'm loyal to. And that is very hard for me to make a decision to exit a situation or um, a relationship when someone has done so right by me. And, and yet I knew in my heart, I knew in my soul that I needed to make a different choice for me. And that was the shameful part. It was, uh, you know, tending and leaning toward guilt, actually not just in the professional realm, but in the personal realm, what ensued later were many, many incredible changes in my life, which were inc very, very difficult decisions to make. So that shame guilt uh, theme stayed with me for much of the 10 plus year journey. And uh, that's also a big teacher, a big, big teacher to the work that I do now, um, because that heaviness and that weight of shame, blame, guilt are hard to, hard to carry. And they actually steal what Bruce was talking about. They steal our zest. They steal our creation. They steal our inner voice. And I'm not saying not to honor them and to feel them, but my light was turned down so, so much by those emotions. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to have processed through them to a great degree. But um, my goal now is to help people move through those things faster. It's, it's weird because I, I have that, um, and, and everyone who listens to this, I mean, I, I, we, we always talk about it. I have that kind of inner whisper, constantly, that, that constant inner whisper that tells me I'm not good enough. You know, that's a, that's something I live with every single day. I try to I kind of try to block it out, but it's a, it's a very interesting one. And I think it's that that also I work obviously working in the aviation sector is very fascinating for me because I'm I, I'm pretty good. I mean, we may have discussed this before, but I'm really good at I can make you know nice coffee, cappuccino. And I think my my kind of history before coming here was with Starbucks and with um, sort of more kind of like retail high street fashion. So then moving into aviation was quite a challenge, and it didn't really help my um, inner whisper when I first arrived in this organisation because there was obviously a lot of questions around um, who I was, um, and I, I had someone who was quite quite obviously had a very um, you know sort of positive sort of you know a promoter within the organization which is really good who was also very very influential which kind of helped me definitely in the early days but it was quite challenging because a lot of people you know just looking at me kind of going what the heck have we hired in the organization he's never worked in aviation before um you know who is this kind of um who is this bloke that i i when i'm listening to you i you you it really um everything really resonates um it's lisa it's really fascinating and what's i think what's really fascinating for me is because when i then the way that you you, you manifest and i know that this is probably sort of post that um that kind of journey to a to a degree but you 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 manifest as very you're very you know very eloquent elegant you know beautiful human um it, st it staggers me that someone um who would kind of manifest and appear like that um would have those kind of inner sort of like questions and those kind of that 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 um that challenge around being um sort of, well not, not not genuine but definitely that that kind of imposter syndrome it's it's really fascinating really fascinating let's let's come over to um to, and thank you for sharing um lisa really um incredibly grateful for that because i think that's one of the challenges we work with a lot of action orientated leaders right i mean i definitely work with a lot of action orientated leaders and it's all it's always kind of head down and they just they're focusing on the end game and all that kind of stuff and i 
definitely we did we did a lot of testing with those people from a psychometric point of view, try to understand them. And, and most of the time they we sort of we we can sort of see that they're kind of you know, the word I would use is probably creaking a little bit. You know, they're they're not quite performing on their A game. They might look like they are, but actually inside they're kind of they're doing quite a lot of masking, um, which is quite fascinating. So please talk to me about um this kind of managing sort of like performance and I'm particularly interested about the data and how we understand all the science behind um, managing performance. Well, as a performer, I've been really intrigued by this idea of how to improve performance <laughs> since I was a young man, quite literally. I mean, yeah. I, I was studying yoga, I was studying meditation, I was studying Tai Chi as a performer because I saw these as tools that would, might give me an edge so that I would get hired for that show instead of the other 5,000 guys. We all, we all looked like Jesus in my day because we were all, it, it was all kind of rock musicals going on. So we all kind of had that look, but what would they, why would they hire me? And so I was always interested in these things to improve my performance. And as I got to study psychology more, and even uh, 40 years ago, some of the new ideas around what human consciousness was capable of, what the brain was capable of, I was drawn to that like bees to honey. I mean, I thought this is, I've got to learn, I've got to understand about this. When I met the founder of HeartMath, who was getting be heavily studying and, and focusing on the human heart and how central the heart actually is to the functioning of our brain, our ability to perform well, it all started to make sense. Like I thought to myself, when you tell your kid, go out there onto the soccer pitch and or in the football pitch and play with your heart, that's your that's the quality that you're wanting them to exhibit if you tell your your, your daughter you go, go out there and just dance with your heart honey it's going to be fine you know dance with your heart sing with your heart speak with your heart just listen to your heart and all these expressions have been part of civilization for millennia and yet science was had been poo-pooing these ideas for the last couple hundred years that it's all just romantic notions don't believe all that stuff the heart's a pump it's an amazing fantastical pump but don't give it credit for more than that. And I didn't believe that was true. And the organization HeartMath decided, let's, there is there is a massive disconnect between all the world's great traditions. The Quran has hundreds of references to the heart, not as just a fantastic pump, but as something we can rely on, that we can go to for wisdom, for the, for the whispers of intuition telling us, it's time to leave. No, that's impossible. It's time to leave. No, there's no way I would never it's time to leave <laughs> that voice. And so we believe that there was that was the heart. But we also knew that uh, life today, people today would not trust just uh, an expression like that. We needed science. And so what I what I loved about heart math and still love about heart math is how much science we we put into this. There have now been more than 400 peer review studies on the efficacy of heart math in every conceivable kind of setting. So back to my, my comments about my, my love affair with uh, British HR directors. <laughs> Perhaps I'm overstating the case there, but I, I had a oh, lot no, of we're loving, no, we're, we're loving it. We're loving it. We're loving the, the problem. Good. Love Excellent. Here. Good. Yeah, no, please bring, bring I, know, I know quite a few um, sort of senior HR leaders in the UK who would love that, love the sentiments because they're pretty much vilified. You know, I think we, I think we exactly. tend to be sort of, we're, we're on the dark side of the force. I think. Right, right. <laughs> so, as I mentioned to you before, and I think I sent this I sent you this article, uh, I, I had the opportunity to write an article around executive performance and health and stress and the connection between the three based on research that HeartMath was doing with senior executives from Shell in the UK, from BP, from Unilever, uh, later from Cafe Pacific, et cetera. And the article was all describing how the performance of an executive cannot possibly be separated from their mental, emotional, and, and even spiritual state, right? And so the, the particular article that I, that I wrote followed this uh, this leader of a, of a UK oil company. We didn't specify which one, but there weren't too many choices. And um, But the, this individual's performance as a leader was, was suffering. People didn't want to work for the guy because he was acting very impulsively, very, very angrily. Well, guess what his what his health was doing his his blood pressure was on the increase he was showing early signs of possible heart disease things were going wrong in his body because of all this stress and tremendous pressure he was under which he was laying you know shoving down downstream to his team and of course what was this doing to the quality of his late relationships family life etc and so we came along and said there are some very specific ways you can start to take control 
of the physiological mechanisms that underpin uh, poor decisions and uh, aggressive behavior and things that were ruining him as a leader and also ruining his health all at the same time. And we'd done, by the time we wrote the article, which was came out in 2003, we'd already been at this for more than a dozen years. So we had a lot of data and a lot of stories and a lot of case studies. And so the, the but the link was very clear that as you can learn how to regulate oneself. And as, as Lisa says, un, you, that what happens is you, that you're then unlocking a potential to perform at a much higher level that you didn't think you had. Because as long as, and for so many of us as leaders, we feel completely overwhelmed by the amount of pressures on us, the amount of things we have to do, managing up, managing down, managing sideways, all these things that go on. And it feels an impossible situation. There's no hope and I couldn't, I'm doing the best I can. Don't you understand I'm doing the best I can? And, and yet we, what we started to learn and Lisa's work confirmed this as well, that there are things that we can do internally that can change the game beyond what you would think. And so the article in Harvard Business Review described this guy getting his blood pressure under control, getting the heart issues under control. He began to listen better because he, was, he wasn't so unregulated to be aggressive all the time and, 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 and making bad decisions too, too fast, all that stuff. He was now listening better. That improved the relations with his team. He realized, I have a bunch of smart people here. Why am I yelling at them all the time? You know, all that was happening too. So the story just got rosier and rosier. And so that's, you know, in, in essence, kind of what we learned was that there are things that we can do that are not hard to learn. They take practice like everything to get that you need to do to get good at. It's not just a magic pill. But uh, which it was, but um, it's not. So, but as we practice, we get better and better, and then of course you can transfer that to others and help others grow and and all that. So, to me, there's an exciting com- uh, dimension of the connection between managing ourselves in ways that are meaningful and real and tangible and very action oriented. Very, you know, I can do this tonight. I can do this breathing technique right now. I can think of my my life right now and say to myself, what can I be grateful for? It's obvious what I'm pissed off about, but what can I be grateful for right now? And our research showed that's a game changer in your body. That's a biological major shift that happens when you start to do stuff like that. So there's there's so much evidence, it's it's exciting. And I could talk for hours just on all the science behind it all, but it's 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 cool. It, 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 it's just I, I well to be fair I could listen to both of you for hours um, genuinely I think it's a uh, it's testament I'm willing to get up at sort of like in the middle of the morning to uh, to basically come and listen. it's actually a fascinating conversation it's you know it's 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 how it always staggers me how quickly human beings give up I we we do um, I teach hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to juggle sometimes simultaneously and we have I think I can do about three or four hundred I could probably do ten thousand but we've got three or four hundred um sets of juggling balls which we we use in big conferences and it's really fascinating and wow. it's it always amazes me that the human um there's there's a point in the there's a point in the in our sessions where I run these sessions and there's this kind of moment where people are really kind of getting it and understanding it it's all very very simple and then suddenly we kind of up the ante not not significantly but it just and it's actually a relatively simple thing to do we're asking them to repeat something they've already learned so they're, they're, they're just going to a, a, a previously learned skill they've just been doing it two seconds before and now they're basically just being asked to just do something you know, to like multiply that effectively which is a very interesting thing and suddenly um they get very 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 frustrated primarily because their bodies aren't able to respond to what their minds are asking them to do. And there's some sort of deep, dark force. And it's great listening to, to Lisa about this, because there's some, this is this sort of like deep, dark force within those individuals as they're doing this, that almost, it's almost like a, um, I'm not going to use the word, I was going to say, it's like a bit of like an exorcism. This, 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 this force takes over, um, takes over their body. Um, and then they're not able to, do what they they want to do. They're not they're, they're physically not able to do what they want to do, which is I always find quite fascinating. And then people start to get incredibly frustrated. They get frustrated with me. They get frustrated with themselves. They they mm. start to you know kind of accuse me of cheating or doing or being or manipulating them, mm. uh, which is quite fascinating. 
and then they just go into that kind of blame game um, about how they can't do it and then they start having a thousand reasons why they could never ever throw a, throw a football you know because they're too old for this or they're too young for this or they've never been good with throwing a ball or they they, they struggled at school with <laughs> it's like and i start you just start getting this barrage of people and then some people just give up they just sit down they just like no i can't do this this is far too complicated i mean you said it was going to be easy and i said well i've never said it was going to be easy um but it's <laughs> but, but actually they say no no you, you just you, you know you're min you're manipulating me and then it's actually weird because I go we we go to another we sort of because I, I'm very aware of what's kind of happening around me as this is happening and I then we sort of re, kind of accelerate through that and we take them just to another kind of play which is actually theoretically more complicated but because it's a little bit more complicated they, they seem to almost get it a little bit better so if you go almost like we kind of go through, go forward a couple of steps, then come back a step. It's it's weird how people suddenly start to start to sort of understand. They can they can sort of visualise it, um, which is which is really interesting. So so, and I'm not sure how um, how much your I know the, the articles that I have from both Lisa and uh, and Bruce by the way. I mean I have actually shared those um, into our already into our WhatsApp group. But um, when this airs, I will definitely sort of reshare those because they both of those. Well, there's, there's multiple articles I've shared. They're actually um, so they're so insightful. Um, Lisa and and Bruce, really amazing. So talk talk to me about these these skills that we can learn. Then, so you do talk about this. There's there's things that we can do to start to sort of like monitor and manage our sort of inner inner self and our inner kind of thoughts. Um, would you be able to share some of these things with us? So go Lisa, sure. can I ask you Lisa, question? yeah. Certainly happy to. So so part of the journey that I traveled, and, and when I look back on it, Andrew, it, it's one of those maps when you you look back at all the facts and what happened when, and it's it's uncanny. It really is. Because the moment that I actually exited corporate, really exited, which was not until around mm, 2015. So 08 to 15 is a is a is a journey in and of itself. And when I exited, when I finally actually was brave enough to say, that's it, I need to go, I need to listen to the voice that's been speaking to me this entire time. I had done a lot of work in that interim period on myself. And so I had more clarity on where I wanted to serve and how. And I had sought many certifications as had Bruce during these journeys to the onlooker, it might look like a, a random, <laughs> uh, just fly by the seat of our pants. Oh, I'll follow this, I'll follow that. No, there was actually a rhyme to the, a, a rhythm to the madness, I think. And during that period in 2016, right after I exited corporate, I had the luxury and the blessing to cross paths with Dr. Joe Dispenza at a live event. I had read the book, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. That single book changed my life. That one book literally helped me understand the science of what had happened to me, quote unquote, not to be dramatic, but how had I had this pseudo meltdown internally amidst all this success? It just didn't make sense. That book tied it out for me in a way that I could understand. I understood the science, I understood the words. It wasn't so deep that I couldn't get it. And it wasn't so simple that it was like, oh, that's too easy. It was just right. And then I had the opportunity to meet him. And as, again, another blessing would, would be presented, he was forming and had formed a corporate program to give back to corporate individuals, professionals, leaders like myself who needed help. And I thought, oh my gosh, I remember standing in Tucson, Arizona or wherever we were, somewhere in Arizona. And I, I literally was in a dining room with him with about 10 people. And I thought the world had just completely opened up. I thought, yes, I've been waiting for this moment for so long. And that is a pivotal part of the, the foundation of my work is the neuroscience of change. I had already gone through the journey myself and now I was being given this this baby gift to try to get certified under his leadership and, and brilliance, quite frankly. He has a way of communicating with humanity at this time in great evolutionary um, acceleration that is, it, it, it is beyond comparison, in my opinion. He can make the very complex understandable 
to all of us. <clears throat> so that was a big part of my path. So the neuroscience of change, understanding the models and the tools for change, understanding that it's outside of us. We can look at a model and then reflect on it internally and make sense of all these shenanigans that go on. All these thoughts and these feelings and these emotions that are conjured up, frankly, because of our limiting beliefs or the inner voice that's out of balance. You know, it doesn't really matter where the where the whisper comes from, but if we can't tie it out scientifically and stand outside of ourselves objectively and see what's happening, then we can't regulate. So it's so beautiful because it's two models for change, four tools for change, and there's a whole lot more to the story with with the you know the basket of things that Bruce and I support and represent. But these are pivotal pieces because if we can teach individuals and teams that, then we can actually move cultures very quickly. So that's um, that's my passion point. And then, and would you be able to um, would you be able to teach me in these tools now? Could I? I just I'm I'm absolutely fascinated by it. I mean, I'm absolutely fascinated by it. So what are some of the? I have my wish. I have my. Um, irritating and nagging uh, whisper. I've been trying to get rid of that uh, irritating and nagging whisper for the best part of 60 years. Um, it doesn't go away. Um, you know, how do I how do I how do I kind of like close it down or should I even should I be closing it down? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm not a I'm not a big proponent of ever closing down um, inner inner whispers or voices that come through. I think it's very important that we lean in and we listen and moreover that mm. we we actually speak to that voice and say, okay, if it's a, a voice that says, Andrew, you're not good enough, which is insane for me to actually hear that that's going on inside of your brilliant mind. And I am not coming from a place of judgment. I understand. I would say partner with it, meet it where it is. Inquiry is one of our best tools. Seek to understand. It's just a thought that's recurring over time, after time, after time, like, like a Groundhog Day type of moment every day when that voice comes in. That means there's power. It's actually rooted somewhere deeply in you. And so that's okay because we can actually follow it. I call them tethers. Follow the tether, follow it, talk to it, follow it. Where does that originate? Can you remember when you first had it? And we can deconstruct this bit by bit, you know, in, in deep individual session work or in, in workshopping. It's not rocket science, but we have to seek to understand where the voice comes from. And by the way, is it even true? Usually it's not. Usually it's something that we just implanted based on said circumstance and that stayed with us. And so we can really get to the etiology of it or the origin story of the limiting beliefs, the limiting thoughts. And then once we become aware of them, we can actually um, migrate into the, the rest of the change model to make different choice, let action behavior follow suit. Then we have a different felt experience and the end product of experience, of course, is an emotion or a feeling in the body. We want that feeling to go away, the old feeling, right? And so we have to go through the process so that we can actually receive the new feeling, not just cover up 80% of the time in the day with the things that we that do make us feel good and the 20% is the whisper that doesn't. No, imagine if the plate was completely full at 100%. Then we're not robbing ourselves from any of these limiting thoughts or limiting beliefs. So that's just a quick tidbit on that. No, this is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. I was, I was, um, I was, I was, I was chatting, uh, listening to you earlier, Bruce. I was listening. I, I had, a, had this most amazing um, conversation uh, with a, a brain surgeon called uh, Dr. Thomas Sareb. He's, um, he works for National Health Service in the UK. I'm not sure if you're familiar how the uh, the health service works in the UK, but it's a bit, bit different to the UK, to mm -hmm. the US. But because um, obviously it's all public, really, it's all public, kind of you know, free at point of um, delivery, which is very interesting. But he's a uh, but Dr. Thomas is a brain surgeon. It's really fascinating. I met him at a conference and we were we sort of shared a stage. And I said, oh, I'd be really lovely to have a conversation with you. And I we always we like to explore um, in my in my kind of sessions, I always like to explore a little bit around failure, which sounds a bit dark. But anyway, we'll, we'll kind of go there in a minute with you, with you guys. But it was um, I, I said, Dr. Thomas, you know, when you know, so what, what does what does kind of failure mean to you? And he and this my my world kind of changed because he said, you know what, Stoss, my the problem I have is that I'm making a lot of commitment to 
mothers, daughters, fathers, brothers, you know, uncles, you know, friends about their, you know, their their, their mother, their son, their daughter, whatever, um, who's got this, you know, terrible, heinous kind of illness or whatever. And we're trying to sort of like solve it for them. And unfortunately, occasionally it doesn't quite go as we plan. You know, and, and the person sort of like passes um, in front of us, which is amazing. Um, and it's a terrible, we just don't know how to deal with it really. So we, and I, and we, we kind of explore that conversation. And I said, so how do you deal with it? Um, Thomas, how do you how do you deal with that? And he goes, and he goes, well, I've tried lots of different things, lots of different um, sort of mechanisms to try and deal with it. Because the biggest and most effective one um, is actually getting a hug. He said, I just I I just kind of got to a point now where hugging is probably the best thing, really, because you know it's either hugging the family or hugging my colleagues um, as this is kind of happening, because um, it's the it's the only way we can kind of really get through it. And then I I was feeling a bit cheeky because I'm quite. I suppose I'm quite a cheeky chappy and I said to um, I said so okay so we, we the conversation moved on a little bit but what he then said was amazing so I said yeah so Thomas if you were gonna um, you know there's that kind of Mary Shelley kind of Frankenstein thing going on right and if you were going to build the perfect human right with your skill set you know I'm slightly fictitious obviously but if you're going to build this build the perfect human being um, where would you start uh, and he just paused and he said, uh, he said, Stotch, do you know what? That's a great question. He goes, why? What I would, what I would start with is, I would just find the human being with the biggest ears possible. Because <laughs> he said, it's just about, you know, how do we get to hear people um, around us? And he says, once I've got the biggest ears available, then I'm going to move into the biggest. Uh, I'm going to find the book. They got these. They're going to have to have massive, like, saucer eyes because um, they want to be able to see themselves and they want to be able to see kind of what's going on as well. That'd be really useful. And then he said, and the other thing, I, he said, I. He said that person, that human being, has to have an enormous heart, massive heart, because it's all for me. It's all about um, heart. And he was talking very much exactly like you, Bruce. He was saying that he obviously he has his hands on the human heart quite regularly when he's operating. And he said it's so. It's like it is a it's a great pump, but it's it's a lot more than that. It's a, it's obviously that whole kind of feeling stuff. So so how? But but again, we have a lot of naysayers out there, right? And what, so what's the science to suggest that the heart is? Because I I I. We, we, we obviously do a lot of thinking with our with our guts and with our hearts and you know play with your heart what's the science behind the heart and, and and why is it so emotional for us that's a big question um, it's a actually, long question I, I, I apologize yeah i do apologize <laughs> <for the question. laughs> no it's great it, it, it's great it's great well as I, as i said we have this intuitive knowing that the heart is somehow central you know it, every culture has done this i've, I've done this this thing in workshops for years. I did it again the other day in West Virginia. I asked the entire room full of people, close your eyes now, now that your eyes are closed, point north. And the 30 people in the room, their arms were going all sort of different directions. And I said, okay, great. Notice all, we, ha we're, we have no agreement here. Close your eyes. Now I said to everybody, now point to yourself. All hands did that, pointing to the heart. Now, were they trained by their parents? If somebody ever asked you to point to yourself, make sure you point to your heart. No, but they, I've seen, I've done this on four continents. 99.9% .9 of all people point to their heart when asked that question. Point to yourself, they point to their heart. The, uh, the, the 0.01 points to their chin or their head, but 99% is the heart. So there's this intuitive knowing. The, the evidence has been kind of remarkable over the last 30 years of what all is coming out about how complex a system the heart actually is. Back in the early 90s, it was discovered by a couple of different teams of researchers that there is a complex neural network of what are, what are called sensory neurites, like, like things we used to call brain cells, but they're in the heart and they, they function as a network. In fact, they're so sophisticated, they are considered a little brain and every human has one. And it's, it's managing affairs of the heart as well as informing the brain upstairs in the skull. And the heart's a hormonal gland. It produces hormones like oxytocin, which is also thought of as the love hormone or the, the mothering hormone. We used to think all hormones are produced in the brain. Not at all. The heart's producing hormones too. In fact, 30 years ago, that was discovered that the heart's a hormonal gland, which is one of the reasons you can feel emotions here. When I was, when I was standing there for the birth of my daughter and the, the nurse handed her to me, it wasn't my head going like that. I mean, my head was so foggy from how long a labor had been. <laughs> my head wasn't doing much of anything. My heart was like, oh my God, oh my God. My heart, I was feeling it in my heart. And so uh, we found through, think, through a particular branch of cardiology called heart rate variability, that there is an absolutely 
moment by moment connection between our thoughts and our feelings and the actual rhythmic patterns that the heart is producing. And a simple way to explain that is if somebody cuts you off in traffic and you can feel your heart racing instantly because you, you thought, oh my God, I was almost killed. I survived, but the heart's still racing. If we could see your actual heart at that moment, it would look like an earthquake. The pattern of what it's doing, it's all over the place, high speed, low speed, it's just, just chaotic and disordered. What we've discovered in the early 90s was that not only is that true for all human beings, put them in a stressful situation, the heart responds looking like a chaotic earthquake type pattern. But we also found that ask them to focus on things they appreciate in their life. Ask them to think about their dog, their grandma, their garden, um, a Christmas Eve, you know, a, a sunset, whatever it may be, vanilla gelato, if that's all you can come up with. And just focus on things that you love. And the heart, instead of looking chaotic, it turns into this beautiful sine wave. And we learned that you can teach that very quickly. You can, because we are, we are as humans capable of sw shifting our focus away from something into something more positive, such as appreciation. So what we found was that um, the idea of kind of repatterning the negative stuff is not as hard as, as we thought, because we all have the human capacity to stop and say, well, what do you appreciate right now? Do you love your, um, your husband? Yes, I do. Do you love your grandma? Yes, I do. Do you, when you stop to think about things like that, you are different and this changes the pattern of the heart. When we also were learning that the heart not only has these, these complex little like brain cells in there, but the rhythm of the heart is being sent to every single cell in your body, in, including and especially your brain. So when the pattern coming out of the heart is now a smooth, efficient pattern, your brain is receiving that instead of receiving earthquake, earthquake, warning, warning. And so you know, smart people do stupid things when, when it's earthquake time in the brain and you make bad decisions and you say things you regret and you're short-sighted and you even you lose physical coordination a lot of times. But as you learn to control that, we found through research that you can control that pattern by shifting your focus. And that has a global effect inside your body and then thanks to current technology and being able to measure the heart, the, the signal that's produced by our heart every moment, every single second that it's beating, that signal is electrical and magnetic. It's an electromagnetic signal. And that signal is not affected by the skin. In other words, it passes through the skin. So you can measure someone's heartbeat several feet away from their body wow. with current equipment that's found in every hospital in Abu Dhabi or Dubai or New York or anywhere. So that's a scientific fact. It's not some weird theory. It's an actual fact. And so when we realized that was going on, you can measure this, this signal that the body is producing, the heart's producing, and that signal is changing depending upon our emotional state. It helps you understand, well, some people you walk up and meet them and, and you just feel instantly drawn. And you say, wow, I just resonate with that person so much. Well, probably you guys were, you know, there was a, a kind of a mutual admiration thing going on there and felt so great to be around them. Contrasted by, you can also be around somebody in a frustrated state, even not showing it outwardly. And you can feel like, wow, I think I need to steer clear kind of thing. So HeartMath put the science to that and said, yeah, that's not just your imagination. It's not just gut feeling, whatever that is, but it's actual science that we put out a different signal physiologically from our body depending upon the emotional state that we're in. Therefore, why don't we learn how to regulate that puppy so that we can be at our best. And as leaders, you know, one of the things I realized when I was kind of going up the scale, kind of similar to Lisa's story, I, I found myself in jobs and thinking, if, if they actually looked at my resume, <laughs> which had no business experience for quite a few years, it, it had acting experience. Like how, how was I possibly prepared for, for these roles, you know, based on my, Okay, you did 800 performances in a long-running musical in New York. And how does that affect your ability to do marketing? I'm like, okay, well, you had to market yourself. Well, that's kind of a stretch. So, uh, but at any rate, it, it, it's, it's, to me, it's, there's, there's so much I could, so much more I could say about how easy it is now to de detect the changes in the heart. But the, the, la the last thing I wanted to comment on, too, I think, is that when you think about whether it's that uh, thought that you were talking about, Richard, uh, Andrew, uh, in your in your brain for years, um, I think from the research of Dr. Joe Dispenza, who 
I have deep admiration for. I know him quite well as well. I've met him personally. I've attended. In fact, Lisa and I met at a at a week long event that he was holding right before uh, the lockdown began in in 2020. I have deep respect for his work. And he and HeartMath have been partnering for quite a few years now. So Lisa and I have multiple reasons why we like working together because we are both fans of HeartMath and Dr. Joe Dispenza and find that the two sets of work really complement themselves uh, beautifully. But I think both organizations have helped us uh, help people understand that when we have had any kind of trauma in our life and trauma doesn't necessarily mean abuse or something that was like a tragic but just something that for whatever reason hits you in a way that you never kind of recovered from and you're still carrying with that with you. Well, that is stored as a memory physiologically in the body. It's not only a thought that sounds very abstract even say a thought. Well, what's a thought? Well, a thought is a vibration. It's a frequency that's measurable these days, but it's also emanating from a physiological reality that you have stored in your body. And so part of reason why these days with the, amount of stress people are under we see people getting triggered like wow how did what i just said possibly lead to that reaction well it wasn't your fault it was they were getting triggered because of something that still is unresolved in their memory in their uh, subconscious in their autonomic nervous system these are all the things that we cover in the work that lisa and i do um and it's no wonder that um when times are so tight and, and tough and so chaotic that we would, many of us would be getting triggered and being kind of shocked. I can't believe I just did that. Where did that voice just come from? But it's because we have to have things that happened 60 years ago to us and it never did quite resolve. And I, th I think part of what HeartMath learned to, to, to suggest one very simple technique, which is not the whole story, but um, is that, you know, the breath is, uh, is one of our most underused and best allies in this whole process. And, and this, is, this has been a, a hallmark of HeartMath's work and, and Dr. Joe's work uh, for, for, for a long time. And so just the idea of breathing slowly, slowing down your breath to about a five second count as you breathe in and a five second count as you breathe out. And, and the way HeartMath suggests is to, is to pretend you could be doing that through your heart, like you're actually breathing in, in and out through your heart, that the process of slowing down the breath and uh, being more conscious of what's going on, your, your, your biological systems are now working in harmony. So as they do that, stress starts to dissolve. It's quite almost magical. Just slowing down your breath, if you do that for 30 seconds or a minute, just that starts to release a buildup of tension, which otherwise goes on unchecked in most people most days. So as you just do something as simple as that, you start to the pressure cooker now you're letting off some of the steam and letting off some of the steam instead of adding more fuel to the fire because well then they did that and then you know and so most people are in that loop of of one stressful thing cycling into the next into the next and then our our reactions are way overblown compared to what the severity of the actual situation was because our system is is tilting with all the the biochemistry of hypervigilant being ready to fight and afraid they're going to be attacked and all that. So these are the kinds of things that I think people can relate to. And then, and there are any number of techniques, not just that one I said, but that's a very simple one that you can use in a meeting. <laughs> you can use while the guy cuts you off in traffic and to get your system back in balance quickly. Okay. That just happened. I'm no good. If I'm like this, I got to Bring it down. I got to be human again. Okay, just breathe slowly through the heart. And that process, as simple as it can sound, is remarkable in its ability to just allow the systems to be back in sync as they're designed to be. It's, you know, it's, it, I, there's this, fant I, I absolutely love um, a guy called uh, Victor Frankel. He's a brilliant quote and he talks about mm -hmm. stimulus response. And I think it's, I was, yes. I, someone just stopped in a, there's the, the whole Abu Dhabi is, is bristling with cameras bristling with cameras and they did they, 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 and i get notifications of you know i can be banned from driving within about two hours um which is and so you get a notification on your phone all that kind of thing and there's certain sort of obviously offenses and when i was um last week oh. it was a very horrendous experience because i was i was going through a set of traffic lights which were green and the car in front of me just decided to stop um in the middle of a junction on a green light 
and um, was trying to, I'm not, not sure quite what her motives was for doing that. And I, I obviously, I, I had nowhere to go, so I, I was then kind of stuck. And then, of course, the lights then went red. And I'm just thinking, this has got like 17 cameras looking at it. You know, I'm about to basically now, you know, lose my license, I'm lose my car, they'll, they'll, they'll impound my car, all that kind of stuff. Because um, this person, and, and, and we just sat there. Um, as the, light, the kind of lights went through the sequence, and I was thinking of the uh, the Victor Frankl quote as I was sitting there, and I was thinking, do you know what? Mm. It's um, I can't control the stimulus, but I can definitely control mm. my response to the stimulus. You know, yes, yes. I sat there, I sat there, kind of like just breathing. Not, so I could have easily. I, I mean, what I really wanted to do was get out of the car and punch her. You know, which I obviously didn't do. That would have definitely not helped the situation. Um, but I, that was my kind of inner kind of thought. But I thought, well, if, if Frank Wall can basically deal with um, that kind of stuff, then I can definitely deal with it. Which is, um, which was really interesting. Uh, last question to both, and that's a, that, I love that. I love the breathing, um, Bruce. It's been amazing. We've run out of time pretty much. But last, last question because I. I think it would be a terrible sin if I didn't ask it. So, Lisa, just if I, I, we have a in 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 the world class, we have a time machine. Um, it's a magical time machine. If I if I took you back, um, only only a couple of years for you, Lisa, but back to when you were eighteen, and I asked you to kind of like mentor um, the eighteen year old Lisa May. Um, what words of wisdom would you um, would you offer Lisa, the younger version? Yeah, beautiful question. I've thought about this a lot. It would be to impart um, one statement. And it would be to be the metal medalless winner, because I was trained from a very early age to perform and win, and that covered up a lot of pain, a lot of trauma, that I never dealt with. And the victory and the medal was the replacement for the actual dealing with the pain, with the stuff. And so um, that would have saved me many, many years had I really understood that because from 18 onward, it was jumping from job into profession and then, you know, executing and driving and achieving all that were, um, you know, quite fleeting, to be honest. And so there's so much more that that 18 year old could have learned early. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Bruce, um, put you in a time machine, took you back to meet the 18 year old dancer. Um, advice, actor, dancer, what would you, what would you say to him? Well, I had the advantage of listening to Lisa's great answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, it's, unfortunately, it's impossible. You can't, you can't beat Lisa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like... <laughs> I, I would say something like, follow your heart, trust, be grateful, and don't stop. Hmm. And I have had a gift in my life that I've had many, many experiences that I'd never imagined I would have. And I learned to accept these remarkable gifts. I did not dream of being an actor as a child. Zero interest in being an actor. I was handed lead role in the high school musical. Two years later, I was invited to audition for the lead part in the longest running musical in the world. I was invited, I was invited, I was invited. They, none of these things were on my vision board of what I want to be when I grow up. I didn't know what I wanted to be. So I, I, I was kind of born with a, a bit of an ability to just go with something, to be, to be able to follow my heart. Um, and yet there have been many times, especially after um, all the health issues that I went through and, uh, and, and stepping away from the CEO position to heart math where I, where I doubted. I, I knew I had to keep following my heart because I, I could not I couldn't not do that but at the same time it was harder to, to have faith at times and and there, there would be voices coming up saying dude are you still convinced this is the way to go and so that's that was the part of you know don't stop and just keep keep trusting keep having faith and then make sure you look back because look at how well everything has worked out and look at how um, where you are right look at where you are right now with this marvelous human being lisa who is a, such a dear friend and and i'm going to see her again in a month in person that'll be cool and 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 andrew to get to know you uh, as well i mean there's so many things that i'm grateful for that even with all the heartaches the tragedies whatever have happened it's brought me here and here i am and here we are and i hope this this last hour with with the three of us has been helpful. 
at least some nugget that everybody can take away and, and just the start of the, just the start of our relationship um lisa and, and bruce it's been absolutely um fascinating um listening to both of you um lisa may uh bruce quiet uh, incredible um thank you for joining us on the world class um i really really appreciate it um I mean, you're, you're going to get me back live now if you're listening to this well it will be a recording so i'm going to come back live i'll catch you live in two seconds